Hello, this is Professor Deborah Chung at University at Buffalo, the State University of New York. And I'm very happy to share with you about my experience uh, in many decades of my life as a materials scientist. Uh, and greetings from the un University at Buffalo. Uh, I was born in Hong Kong, and this is my family, and I'm the little one in this picture. My mother, Rebecca, joined the Flying Tigers in China as a nurse during World War II. And this is the uh, headquarters of the Flying Tigers in Kunming, China. And this is my mother uh, uh, working in the clinic of the Flying Tigers there. And this is outside the hospital. It is the 14th U.S. Army Station Hospital. Very simple, one floor wooden structure. And at that time in World War II, the eastern seaboard of China was cut off by Japan. So the only way of uh, getting things in and out of China was through the back door of China, which is the Burma Road that links Kunming, China to Burma. Um, and this road goes across the Himalayas, so it's very dangerous. However, later on, J Japan cut off this Burma road so that even this backdoor road is not feasible. So they had to fly and flying over the Himalayas using these propeller planes that are not supposed to fly that high uh, with essentially no communication, no computer at that time. It was extremely dangerous and a lot of planes and a lot of lives were lost as a result. And, and, and uh, this is how the plane looks like, propeller plane, and this little ladder taking people uh, on and off the aircraft. Um, this is uh, one of the pilots, and, and the pilots and mechanics, uh, a lot of them are from the U.S. And this is my mother uh, with her passengers deplaning uh, on the hump route back in 1943 during the war. Um, inside the aircraft, there are no windows. <laughs> uh, and my mother received these U.S. World War II medals. And this is her autobiography called Piloted to Serve. In 1969, the first person landed on the moon. I was super excited. I was in high school in Hong Kong at that time, so excited that I decided to leave Hong Kong for the U.S. after high school at the age of 18. I attended California Institute of Technology, also called Caltech, and uh, it's a very good school, and I majored in engineering, particularly electrical engineering, uh, and I ended up being one of the four first women graduates of this university. Uh, this is me in the middle here. <clears throat> and I was particularly interested in integrated circuits. And Professor Carver Mead, the father of this field, uh, taught us how to design and make integrated circuits back in 1972, which is very, very early for the teaching of integrated circuits. However, I got into research under Professor Paul Douay, the father of amorphous metals, and I fell in love with research right away because research means the pushing of the frontier of knowledge. Nobody knows that, you are gonna figure it out. Uh, and also I learned that materials constitute the foundation of technology, whether electronics, aerospace, automobile, construction, environment, energy, or health. In addition, materials mark the history of human civilization, whether Stone Age, Bronze Age, or Iron Age. After graduation from Caltech, I moved on to MIT, or Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and uh, I got very interested in materials, uh, particularly about graphite, uh, such beautiful arrangement of ca carbon atoms in graphite. And I started to uh, ha do my dissertation research under Professor Dresselhaus, a very famous carbon scientist. 
uh, graphite has a layered crystal structure with each layer looking like a honeycomb. Okay? And one can insert between the layers certain foreign atoms or molecules, and that results in uh, the, the uh, great increase in the electrical conductivity of the graphite to the ex degree that the graphite becomes a metal. And that was uh, very intriguing in both physics and chemistry. And I uh, uh, did this line of research actually for 15 years. After graduation from MIT, I continued uh, doing this line of research a as a faculty member. And I became actually a one of the world authorities on this subject. However, my only field of expertise was declining. And that was a big challenge. Uh, the, the, the decline was mainly because the applications did not quite work out. Uh, the physics and chemistry might be beautiful, but if the applications don't quite work out, the field would dry up and decline. And that was pretty much what was happening. And I was still pretty young at that time, so I decided to leave my only field of expertise. But that was my only field of expertise. Uh, how, what else should I do? You know, I, I was like a blank piece of paper. Um, so I was forced to think out of the box. And I was forced to jump out of my comfort zone. Okay. Not easy at all. Uh, but my broad education at Caltech helped. Okay. Um, so because of that jumping out, I ended up pioneering these four research topics. Structural self-sensing, vibration damping through interface-derived viscoelasticity, electromagnetic interference or EMI shielding materials, and thermal interface materials. And I'm going to share with you uh, very briefly about each of these. I got interested in cement or concrete, even though I had never <laughs> mixed or studied cement before. However, I've studied electrical behavior of materials. So I started to study cement as if it's an electronic material, a very crazy line of research. And because of that, I ended up inventing smart concrete, uh, which is concrete that contains a very small amount of short carbon fiber. And it's important to disperse these short fibers very well in the cement. And I, I developed a technique for doing that. Um, now, the, the fibers that I use in the cement is not continuous fibers, because continuous ones are not suitable for uh, incorporation into the cement mix. Rather, I use the chopped carbon fibers, which can be thrown into the cement mix. Now, uh, people have been making structures able to do various functions, such as sensing, by device incorporation. That is, incorporating, say, a sensor into the cement or concrete. Um, however, this is not my route. I do not involve uh, any device incorporation. Rather, I make the concrete itself be a sensor. And that is uh, really something revolutionary. Uh, the advantages of my route include low cost, high durability, large sensing volume, and the mechanical performance not compromised. The applications include the weighing of trucks as they move on a pavement uh, made using the smart concrete. Similarly, traffic monitoring. Also, the weighing of each room of a building to control the heating, cooling, ventilation, and lighting for saving energy. In addition, the vibration sensing can be achieved, and a lot of structures uh, undergo vibration. Um, in addition, oil gas wells, geothermal wells, as well as carbon sequestration wells all involve cement as a sealant between the steel tubing, which called a casing, and the rock. Okay? Uh, and monitoring the pressure uh, experienced by the cement ceiling is very important. If the ceiling doesn't work well, you can have oil spill, which can be very ter terrible for the environment. 
Now, electrical measurement is involved in the use of smart concrete because uh, the smart concrete has its electrical resistance change depending on the deformation that it experiences. Um, and electrical measurement uh, uh, can be done using four electrical contacts or two electrical contacts. Um, four electrical contacts means having the two outer contacts for passing current, the inner two contacts for measuring the voltage, and that's called the four probe method. However, if you have only two electrical contacts, each contact is used for both current and voltage, and we call that two probe method. Okay. Um, in general, the four probe method is much superior to the two probe method because the contact resistance, that is the resistance associated with each electrical contact, is not included in the measured resistance in the four probe method, but is included in the measured resistance in the two probe method. Okay. And you can see that I have four electrical contacts. Right? Uh, and that's very important. And so it's not just a matter of uh, developing the concrete. It's also a matter of measuring uh, the concrete in terms of its electrical behavior correctly. The electrical resistance changes upon deformation. And this phenomenon allows the sensing of the deformation. And it's called piezo resistivity. Piezo means stress, right? So the stress or strain changes the resistivity. Um, and here is the uh, fractional change in the resistance uh, uh, shown in solid, a uh, bold curve. And shown in thin curve is the strain, which is the fractional change in dimension along the same direction as the resistance measurement. And I have uh, various strains, uh, small strain, bigger strain, little strain, still bigger. It's just an uh, arbitrary. Uh, uh, progression of different strains, uh, uh, one cycle after the other. And every time one strains, that is one compresses, uh, the resistance goes down. Okay. And uh, um, we, uh, we can sh uh, plot the resistivity at the peak of a cycle versus the strain at the peak of a cycle, and connecting the data points chronologically. And we find that there is very little hysteresis, and it's more or less linear. Okay? And so it really works. And this utilizes the four-probe method. But if one uses the two-probe method, it does not work. Okay? And that's an illustration of how important correct electrical measurement is. Even if one is not an electrical engineer, one needs to know uh, such electrical measurement techniques. Uh, this bridge in Minneapolis fell down suddenly, uh, and some people got killed. Very terrible. Uh, it'd be nice if there's some indication before this, this, is a, this is a disaster. But unfortunately, there was none because there was no sensing ability. Um, the degradation of concrete is a big issue, and many bridges in this country is structurally deficient. Um, one of the reasons for the damage of the concrete is due to freezing and thawing. Okay? And you get cracks uh, because of the multiple cycles of freezing and thawing that the concrete experiences. The reason why freezing and thawing is such a headache is that ice has lower density than water. Now, this is ice with the H2O molecules more separated because of the uh, 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 H2O molecules having a certain pattern of arrangement that's feasible when it's in solid state. But when it's in liquid state, the H2O molecules are kind of more free to move around. They don't have this pattern. And so the water molecules uh, become more densely packed. As a result, the ice has lower density than water. Um, and we see that everyday life. 
because ice floats on water. See? Okay. And the fact that ice floats on water is actually very important. Otherwise, all the ice uh, on, on the lake <laughs> would sink, right? Uh, and if the ice on the lake sinks, you know, then eventually the whole lake would freeze and all the fish in the lake would die. Right? And that doesn't happen simply because ice floats on water. Uh, so in that sense, that's great. Uh, but uh, for concrete, the, there's always some uh, excess water in the concrete. And the concrete uh, uh, kind of traps the water in there. And uh, upon freezing, the water inside the concrete wants to expand a little bit. Uh, and so it causes cracking, particularly if you have multiple cycles of this freezing and thawing. It's like fatiguing. You know? Uh, and so you get these cracks. Um, in wintry places, this is uh, very, very common. Um, and so how does one monitor the health of a structure? Well, <laughs> measuring the crack <laughs> width is one way, uh, but that's uh, not very sensitive. You know, it'd be nice if you can detect the damage before the crack becomes visible. Okay. Um, uh, another way, a better way than j just uh, measuring the crack width is to use what's called acoustic emission, which is using a sensor, a transducer, uh, to hear the uh, acoustic, the sound that comes out during the cracking. Okay? Now, this tur turns out to be ultrasonic uh, sound, uh, which makes it more, uh, more sensitive than the audible sound. But anyway, it, it's sound. Uh, and you know, when, when uh, damage occurs, uh, just like breaking things, uh, sound uh, comes out. And so by listening, uh, one can monitor. But uh, uh, after it's uh, formed the, the crack, it's finished giving the sound. <laughs> so you, ha you, you have to listen, it, listen to, to the thing uh, all the time. Otherwise, you'll miss something. Um, so, it, 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 and also you, you can listen here and there, but not everywhere. Um, so it, it's a limitation. Uh, but what I have is not use any sensor, but use electrical resistance measurement to monitor the freeze-thaw damage in real time. Uh, and this shows in a bold line the resistance and in thin line, the temperature. And you note know that the temperature cycles between uh, minus 20 degrees C, which is below zero, and plus 50 degrees C, which is above zero. So it's freezing, thawing. Um, and uh, every time one uh, uh, cools, uh, the resistance goes up. Every time one cools, the resistance goes up. Uh, and that, that's another story. Uh, I won't go into that. But the in interesting thing is that both the upper envelope and the lower envelope gradually increases, cycle by cycle, as the freeze-thaw cycling takes place. And that's an indication of damage. Da damage almost always increases the, the resistance. Um, and one sees that the damage occurs in every cycle incrementally. And it finally fractures at the coolest point of the last cycle. Okay? And this is the very first time that anybody has been able to monitor freeze-thaw damage in real time. Uh, and it's important uh, to do this monitoring also for the sake of understanding the process of freeze-thaw freeze cycling damage. Another er area of my pioneer work is about vibration damping. Uh, that means you know, reducing the vibration over time. Okay? And structures don't like to shake around. You know? uh, like this bridge, you, know, you need damping for it. Like this railroad, that, uh, that, you know, uh, it needs to uh, have the vibration reduced, and along with that, sound reduced. Vibration and sound are cousins, because a sound wave is also a me mechanical wave. Okay. Uh, there are, in general, two types of vibration control for structures. One is passive, the other is active. Passive means you don't uh, 
use any device in corporation, rather use the uh, certain material that is able to absorb the mechanical energy, and we call that energy dissipation. Active control means the use of sensor and actuator in a synchronized fashion, uh, such as this. You have a sensor in red and actuator in, in green. Uh, this is a beam uh, uh, that is uh, undergoing bending up and down. And uh, w when it's uh, vibrating downward, you poke it upward using the actuator. When it's vibrating upward, you poke it downward using the actuator. You know, that's really brute force, and that's called active control. That works very well, but it is extremely expensive. Um, so the passive control is the way uh, that's uh, uh, practical. Um, now, in passive damping, it utilizes the viscoelastic behavior of materials. Now, up here is the elastic behavior, totally elastic, not viscoelastic, which means that uh, the stress and the strain are linearly related, and the loading and unloading curve exactly overlaps. There's no hysteresis. But in, in the viscoelastic behavior at the bottom, the loading and unloading curves don't overlap. As a result, there's hysteresis, and this results in energy dissipation. Um, and this area of the hysteresis is actually related to how much energy is dissipated per unit volume per cycle. The mechanism of viscoelastic behavior in, in rubber or plastics like rubber is illustrated here. You have long, crooked molecules, and they can uh, be straightened, uh, and they can move you know, upon stretching. And such movement of the molecules uh, uh, allows the dissipation or consuming of the mechanical energy, and thus giving viscoelastic behavior. And, and so rubber is used as a cushion <laughs> for, for that purpose. Um, however, rubber is ineffective for uh, um, removing the mechanical energy because it is too soft. Okay? The energy is like force times distance, right? If it's too soft, the force is tiny, even though the distance is a lot. And so the product, f force times distance, is still too tiny. And so because rubber is too soft, it's just not able uh, to really dampen, not able to uh, um, dissipate the mechanical energy. Uh, it can act as a cushion which spreads the mechanical energy only. Um, using polymers such as rubber for damping has quite a number of disadvantages. Uh, one is the low stiffness is too soft, uh, low strength also, and also poor durability. We all know that rubber bands don't work anymore uh, after a while. It becomes brittle, right? Uh, that's because of uh, uh, some reaction involved uh, with the oxygen. Uh, however, using structural materials for damping, that's revolutionary, but it has advantages. High durability, high stiffness, and large volume. The volume matters because that area of the hysteresis loop corresponds to the amount of energy dissipated per unit volume. So you have large volume for the structure, then you would be able to dissipate a lot of energy. Okay. Uh, but the, this is uh, revolutionary. People have n not even dreamed about using a structural material which is stiff for uh, vibration damping. Um, and I, I explained already that this is energy per unit volume. So using a big structure helps. Uh, and to get a stiff material to be able to have viscoelastic character, one needs new science. Okay? And I have uh, uh, pioneered this new field, which uses interfaces in a material to provide energy dissipation because very slight slippage at the interface and with friction involved in the slippage would consume the mechanical energy, a very slight slippage. Um, and 
uh, I call this interface derived viscoelasticity. But for this to be appreciable, you need to have a lot of interfaces. And with a nano stuff nowadays, you can have a lot of interfaces per unit volume. So using interfaces, I developed structural materials that are both stiff and able to dampen. This is an example. Uh, this is my first example of this phenomenon. I added tiny silica particles called silica fume to cement. Uh, and because these are tiny particles, uh, nanoparticles, uh, their introduction gives rise to a lot of interfaces, interface between the particle and the cement matrix. And, and because of the interface, uh, you, you have this interface derived viscoelastic um, uh, behavior. Thus, the material be becomes able to dissipate mechanical energy. But at the same time, the, the silica fume addition strengthens the material, makes it stiffer and stronger, okay, because the silica fume is a reinforcement. So you have a situation where the material becomes stiffer, and at the same time, it becomes more viscoelastic and more able to dampen. You know, uh, you, uh, having both a a aspects improved by the addition of silica fume. And uh, when I first presented this, in 1998, people just could not accept it because they were thinking along the line of rubber. See, if you modify rubber so that the rubber becomes stiffer, it would have less damping ability. You gain one and lose the other. You cannot have both improved at the same time. And so this is just <laughs> involving a different science, and people were not used to this new science. Uh, here's another example of interface-derived viscoelasticity that, uh, that I also put forth. Uh, it involves having carbon fibers. Uh, carbon fibers are a micron, a micrometer in scale, in diameter. Uh, but between the layers of the carbon fibers in a laminate, you have a region uh, which is polymer-rich, and we can put some nanofillers, na like nano fibers or nanoparticles into this space here. Um, and, and because it's nano, you have a lot of interface area per unit volume. And therefore, the addition of, of this nano filler in the space between the la layers of the laminate would improve the viscoelastic character, thus improving the damping. Okay. Um, Another uh, pioneered field of mine is related to electromagnetic radiation. Uh, there are m a lot of sources of electromagnetic radiation. Uh, you have microwave oven. You have mobile phones. You have a uh, fluorescent lamp and many, many other electronic items, all evolving electromagnetic radiation, particularly a radio wave and microwave. And this regime of electromagnetic radiation can really cause malfunction of electronics because electronics have electrons in, in their moving, and the electrons can feel the electric field uh, in the electromagnetic radiation so they can go wild. Um, so we need to have materials that can shield or block the radiation. Okay? We need to shield the, the uh, radiation sources so that the radiation, radiation cannot come out. We also need to shield the electronics to protect them. Uh, carbon fiber composite is one of the uh, materials that are effective for shielding, and so you can see it's utilized for this com computer box. Uh, transformers also involve uh, electrons moving in, in these coils, and, uh, and they are all over uh, society uh, because you need to get, uh, change the voltage, you know, a high voltage uh, change to 110 volts, for instance, uh, and transformers are needed. Uh, and they uh, need shielding too. The pacemaker uh, involves a, a wire uh, which sends a current to activate the heartbeat. Okay? 
and, and, uh, and so you have electrons moving in this wire, uh, and, and, uh, and then shielding is also needed. And this is critical on a pacemaker. If, if it doesn't work, uh, the person can die. Uh, factors that govern the shielding effectiveness traditionally is just the, based on the electrical conductivity. Okay, more conductive, better in shielding. But what I have put forth is a, a new concept. Namely, it's not just the conductivity. It's the surface area or interface area per unit volume. Uh, the more the area per unit volume, the more is the shielding effectiveness. And this uh, is because of what's called the skin effect. Namely, the electromagnetic radiation can penetrate only the near surface region, what, what's called the skin, of a conductor. The inside region is sitting there not feeling the radiation because the radiation uh, uh, you know, de decays exponentially as it goes in. So inside, uh, it's just <laughs> the material doesn't see the radiation at all. Okay? So if you have a, a, a material in the form of a composite, the matrix is not able to shield, but you put some fillers in there, and the fillers are able to shield because they are conductive. And if uh, each uh, fiber here is big and fat, then the inside of each fiber is wasted, just sitting there, not feeling the radiation. So overall, the composite would not be very effective for shielding because you're wasting most of each fiber present. However, if each fiber has a very small diameter, then the whole of that fiber volume can be utilized in shielding, and that would make the overall composite much better for shielding. Um, and nowadays we have nanotechnology, so nanofibers are available, and, and, and so uh, uh, this is an area where nanotechnology excels. Uh, that's for shielding. Now here's the periodic table of the elements, and carbon is this one element up there. Uh, it's just one element, but a lot of different materials uh, come out from this one element. Okay? Um, there are three allotropes of carbon, graphite, diamond, and fullerene. The graphite is the biggest of the three families. It includes all these, graphite itself, graphite fibers, carbon nanofibers, carbon nanotubes, intercalated graphite, that is the graphite with the foreign atoms or molecules in between the carbon layers, exfoliated graphite, flexible graphite, graphene, activated carbon, which ha has porosity, and carbon black. Okay? All these are carbons, or graphite, uh, in the graphite family. Okay? Um, now, this is graphite flake, uh, which uh, can be mined from the ground. Um, and you can intercalate the graphite flakes uh, uh, and then suddenly heat that rapidly and it puffs up. And we call that puffing up exfoliation. And the exfoliation is because the intercalate uh, um, uh, w wants to expand or vaporize and thus there's a ballooning action. Um, uh, and this is the exfoliated graphite. Yeah. One flake has become looking like a worm, having a cellular structure, and uh, you can see the cellular structure. As a result of that structure, you have a lot of surface area per unit volume, and that helps the shielding. And uh, um, actually, the intercalate is in the form of islands, uh, shown by these dashed lines. And uh, the ballooning effect that I'm talked about involves the, these islands uh, becoming balloons, and that's the exfoliation process. And this is uh, the cellular structure so show, uh, showing the, these uh, balloons. <laughs> uh, 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 and uh, uh, and uh, this is the cell wall. And the cell wall actually consists of, say, 60 carbon layers. And, and the carbon layers can slide relative to one another very easily. Thus, the balloon wall can be stretched a lot 
and that's why it, it, it can balloon. <laughs> uh, um, and this is uh, the exfoliated graphite, even more exfoliated. And here it is even more exfoliated. Um, and if, if you shake this thing, it can uh, get loose, and it becomes graphene. Okay? Um, and, and if you take a lot of these exfoliated graphite pieces and com <coughs> compact them, uh, because of the cellular structure, there is mechanical interlocking between these pieces, and so it becomes a sheet in the absence of any binder. Okay? And this sheet is actually flexible, and it is a little springy in the direction perpendicular to the plane of the sheet. Uh, and this is called flexible graphite. And I discovered that this material is excellent as a shielding material with this record high shielding effectiveness of 130 dB. Uh, and, and that is because it, uh, it, it's not only conductive, it also has substantial surface area per unit volume. And one can cut uh, the sheet you know, uh, to make gaskets, okay, uh, EMI gaskets. Now, computers can get hot, <laughs> and that is a big problem. Uh, the overheating of microelectronics limits the further miniaturization, limits the power, and limits the reliability. This is a big, big issue. Uh, to improve the, uh, uh, the, this uh, cooling issue uh, and make it cool better, then uh, we need heat sink to channel the heat out. Okay, the heat coming from, say, the microprocessor. The heat goes to the heat sink and gets channeled out to the, to the environment. Um, but this thermal contact between the microprocessor and the heat sink is very important. Uh, if this thermal contact is bad, you are not getting the heat to flow from the microprocessor to the heat sink very well. Then you're not utilizing the heat sink very well. Okay? And to improve that thermal contact, one puts into this interface a material called a thermal interface material. Now, this material needs to conform very well to the surface topography of these two mating surfaces. Um, now, no surface is ever perfectly smooth, even if you mechanically polish it. And so you have two mating surfaces. This is a blown up view. Uh, each surface is not perfectly smooth. And if your thermal interface material is not conformable enough, it would not go into each of those uh, 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 air voids enough. So you, uh, you have uh, air pockets left at the interface, and the air is a thermal insulator. And, and so this is lousy thermal interface material. So the thermal interface material has to be very conformable, not just thermally conductive. Okay? People have all along been thinking about the thermal conductivity being high as the number one requirement of a thermal interface material. They simply ignore the issue of conformability. But I put forth uh, this new concept that conformability is very, very important. Uh, um, the carbon black is a form of uh, 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 carbon in the graphite family. That's in the form uh, of powder particles. And uh, it's actually uh, aggregates of nanoparticles. Okay. Uh, you can see aggregates of nanoparticles. And because of this morphology, if you just uh, uh, compress it a little bit, it would just squish, just squish. <laughs> uh, and because of that squishing, it becomes conformable. This is before the compression, before the squishing. This is after the squishing. And uh, so after the squishing, it just conforms to the surface topography of whatever surface you use to squish it with. Okay. Uh, and so the carbon black, even though it is a solid and it is thermally conductive, it is highly conformable. And by using the carbon black, I was able to 
invent a thermal interface material which is very good because of its high conformability. And carbon black is very cheap also. You have a lot of that in your chimney. <laughs> I'd like to uh, mention that it's it, very nice to learn from nature. Okay, a lot we can learn from nature. Uh, like the spider web, okay, the spider here, uh, and the web is just a wonderful structure, and the silk involved in the spider web is mechanically very good, uh, strong and ductile. Uh, and here shows the spider uh, <laughs> uh, getting the silk out <laughs> of its mouth. Um, and nowadays, we, we play a lot with fibers, like carbon fiber, and we weave the fiber to make a piece of cloth. Oh, but if we consider the spider web, it's just a different level of technology. Uh, and there's so much we can learn, not only ab about the web, uh, how the spider makes the web, but also the, the silk itself. Fish, okay, uh, they, they breathe, okay, and the fish breathes like this. Uh, when it in inhales, water goes into the mouth, the mouth is open, and the gill cover is closed. And this is uh, the top view, showing the water going in, and uh, the, the, the gills actually absorbs the, the oxygen which the, the, the fish needs. And in exhaling, the mouth is closed and the gill cover is open so that the remaining water, after the absorption of the oxygen, would go out from the gill, okay, the gill cover. Um, so it's, it's interesting process, <laughs> um, uh, something to learn. Uh, the bird is even more fantastic in terms of the technology. It's so maneuverable. They're going left and right, up and down, uh, and so durable, and so miniaturized, and so quiet. You know, aircraft is not very quiet. And also, there's no need for aircraft uh, airport runway. It just lands on this wire very comfortably. And there's no need to recharge batteries. <laughs> like electric vehicles, uh, uh, you would need to recharge batteries. Um, so our aircraft technology is nowhere near what the bird can do. A lot to learn. The space shuttle, it, back in 2003, disintegrated upon re-entry. And these seven astronauts lost their lives. And that is because the space shuttle has a lot of these thermal protection tiles. And some of those came off. Okay, just coming off. You know, this is a joining problem. Uh, you know, joining should be a, an old technology that's very matured. But that's what happened. Um, and if we look at nature, like our tooth, you have the enamel uh, cover, and then you have the dentin underneath. And, and the joining of the enamel and the dentin is very good. It's not easy to get the enamel off. It's a very good joint. Okay? Um, it's, it's a lot uh, to learn from nature, just in terms of joining. Here's a cell, a single cell. Okay? And you, you have uh, the nucleus in the middle, and you have the cell membrane. Okay? Uh, and this cell membrane has within it a motor for energy. And this motor looks like this. Now, this is the membrane, and this is the motor. The motor is tiny, tiny. The diameter is about 50 nanometer. And it can rotate at 1,700 revolutions per second. Such very, very high speed of, of rotation and such very tiny dimensions is just, 
no, uh, so so uh, extremely uh, high tech that none of our high tech uh, can can uh, uh, reach that at all. It, it's just far beyond uh, our, our 21st century technology of of motors, uh, and, and this rotation is imp is utilized in ha getting this propeller to to rotate, okay, so that the bacteria can swim as the propeller rotates. Okay, so a lot to learn from nature. And a lot of this learning needs to be done through self-study. You cannot just rely on your teacher or certain textbook to teach you that. Uh, you need to have an inquisitive mind and study that on your own. Okay. In studying science, or engineering, it's very important to grasp firmly the basic scientific concepts. There's n no way out of that. You've got to not only learn it, you have to digest that. Just not, no memorization. It's not a matter of memorization. It's a matter of truly understanding the thing and digesting the thing. Okay. Um, now, like this equation, E equal to mc squared. Okay. Actually, most of us just accept this because we trust Einstein, right? And, and it's true that a, a, a lot of, if you have to derive everything under the sun, uh, uh, bef uh, it, you know, it, it'll take you a lifetime, right? And it's hard to advance science uh, uh, if you have to you know, derive everything. Uh, so you need to have a certain degree of trust, okay? But for the beginners, learning about the basic science, basic physics and basic chemistry. One should not rely on trust. Just trust this textbook. <laughs> it should be right. <laughs> trust this professor. It should, not, it should be right. Now, it, for the, such basic science that one learns, one should not take things for granted through trust. It's very important to study broadly. Um, not just your major, okay, the required courses, not just that, but even outside your major, beyond the required courses. Uh, the disciplines involved in my research include material science and engineering, mechanical engineering, thermal engineering, electrical engineering, physics, chemistry, and mathematics. All these are utilized in the research that I described to you. For instance, I mentioned about microelectronic cooling. Okay. It involves thermal engineering as well as material science and engineering. But the application is in electrical engineering. Um, and uh, uh, some people say, oh, my background is not electrical engineering. I know thermal engineering, but electrical energy engineering is not my cup of tea. <laughs> so they just shy away from such topic. And that's a shame, right? Don't shy away. You know, uh, we need to, to be bold and brave and be, be willing to cross disciplinary boundaries. Yes, this is in the context of electrical engineering, but it needs people that are knowledgeable about thermal energy as well as materials engineering. Also, we need to understand the technological needs. Okay? What are the needs in uh, electronics industry, in, in the construction industry, in the energy industry, and so on? Okay. Um, because uh, we, we, we eventually, when you uh, have your career, you need to uh, know what are the technological needs so that you can fill those needs. Learning has to be continuous. After you graduate, you need to continuously learn on your own. I learned all those four things that I mentioned to you today, th those four pioneering fields. I learned all of them through continuous learning on my own. And uh, when you're out in your career, it's important to have sustained professional contribution. It's not being uh, a, a good pr uh, contributor to the to the profession for a few years. No, for decades, 
keep, keep going. And, and that's what I've been doing for 47 years. Also very important are the communication skills, both oral and written. If you know a lot of things in your heart, but you cannot communicate out, it's kind of almost useless, right? It's just on your, in your heart, okay? Um, and so uh, really pay attention to cultivating both your oral communication skill and your written communication skill. Now here's is success. To reach that, it takes knowledge, hardworking, sincerity, and humility. However, one can go down because of ego, jealousy, cheating, and laziness. Okay, I hope all of you <laughs> would reach the success. The vocation uh, is something uh, uh, that uh, what you have passionate, you are passionate about, overlapping with what the world needs, and that overlap is your calling, and that's your vocation. Okay, that's your lifetime homework, okay, your assignment for your life, and you have to uh, uh, be devoted, be dedicated to that that uh, that vocation, because that's your lifetime calling. Intelligence quotient IQ, uh, you know, that's important, okay? Uh, but emotional quotient EQ is also important because it allows you to be able to still keep going forward in the midst of difficulties. But spiritual quotient SQ is also important. It relates to understanding the meaning of life. What are you living for? Okay. If you have, uh, 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 you're not living for uh, uh, anything, that is, you think, oh, when I die, it just and it, uh, <laughs> the end of, uh, end of story, then why work hard? <laughs> uh, just eat and drink, right? Um, so it's very important to have a purpose in life. And with a purpose, uh, uh, life becomes meaningful, and the chance of success becomes much better. So I wish each of you a lot of success and joy in your life. Thank you.